Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first plenary. We want to talk about what a fair economy could look like. And before I present the panel to you and also introduce myself, we will watch a video together to kick off the panel to have an introduction to the plenary session. Right, there we are back. Um, I just decided to stand because I'm excited about this session. I might fall off that chair. Good um, morning to everybody. My name is Almut Möller. I'm very, very happy and I feel indeed honored to be invited to chair this first session and panel. Thank you very much to PS2 inviting me again. I remember vividly the discussions I was allowed to help facilitating in Prague. So thank you very much for having me back. Um, I work in Berlin normally with the German Council on Foreign Relations as a, an analyst on European integration. And um, I'm excited about the setup of this particular session because what we're supposed to be doing is to respond to what you discussed this morning. There was a lot of work going on this morning in um, overall, I think it was 13 workshops where you engaged, interacted, already discussed very, very controversial issues. And um, Paul Hugo helped me to gather the statements that you put together at the end of those workshops to, in a nutshell, present to the leaders on the panel um, what you consider the most crucial aspects, really, and the most difficult challenges with regard to the question, how can a fair economy look like? And um, President Rasmussen said just now, the old Europe is over. The question is, how will the new Europe look like? And I think this is happening in a very difficult time. Um, tough questions need to be addressed. Debates will have to be controversial and there needs to be radical thinking. Um, all under immense time pressure, and I believe everybody feels that, and you probably felt that in the workshops this morning. Um, we're discussing, but we feel that time is running out. Um, so what we want to do now is to take on the comments and the questions that you raised in the workshops, and we want to discuss them with the leaders. Um, just one um, information for those who will uh, have translation devices. We're going to have uh, five channels. The first one is English. The second one is French, the third one is German, the fourth is Spanish, and the fifth is going to be Dutch. Right. I have the great pleasure and honor to introduce to you a very, very distinguished panel of leaders. And I would like to start on my um, right-hand side and sitting next to me, if I'm managing Right, there you go. <laughs> um, on my uh, right is sitting Emma Reynolds, who is joining us uh, from the United Kingdom. She is the Shadow Minister for Europe. We're very delighted uh, to have you on the panel. And then we have uh, on, the, on my right-hand side, on the uh, very right, Joseph Muscat, the leader of the Malta Labour Party. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Alex Baudry, who is joining us from Lux Luxembourg um, of LSAP. Thank you very much for being here on the panel. On my very left, we have Karl-Heinz Lamberts, who is the president of the PES group in the Committee of the Regions. A very warm welcome to you. And um, to my left, we have Victor Ponta joining us from Romania, the leader of PSD Romania. So thank you to all of you for being here. And uh, I already have to apologize for maybe having to be rude at some stage and trying to cut off a little bit uh, because we have limited time and there is so many things that have been discussed in the workshops. Um, 
and let me just briefly take a look because uh, Poligo literally put uh, together this now a few minutes ago. And my impression is there were three overarching questions that were addressed um, in the panels. And I want to go for the first one. And I believe this is very crucial and it has been addressed already. And that question is fundamental. Um, and that is how can politics get back into the driving seat? How can we make sure that the economy is subordinate to politics, that politics is creating frameworks and not the other way around. And there is a lot of concern that time might be running out for this to happen, that we have already reached a level where this will be extremely difficult. So there was a workshop, um, workshop uh, for addressing this question, how to democratically subordinate economy to distinctive values-based progressive politics that emancipates people. And this, uh, this overarching question was also addressed in a number of other workshops, such as the workshops uh, Markets on Watch, um, the financial transaction, uh, taming the markets, um, all those aspects were raised. So this very fundamental question I would like um, to put to Alex uh, Baudry uh, for a start, and you have your microphones there. So how can politics get back into the driving seat? We miss. And um, do we, yes, maybe just you, sir. Hello. Could, are the micro, do we have to switch the microphones on? It's working. Oh, it's working, yeah. Bon, merci d'abord pour pouvoir participer. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. I believe that this is really a key question. This is really a key question asked to the European socialists. Actually, the neoliberal theory is being criticized everywhere. And I think that we should actually witness the end of this movement. And at the time when we should witness the end of this uh, movement, well, nothing has happened. Uh, it, uh, really, it is now uh, the economy that is prevailing uh, uh, over the uh, politics. So we need to change. We need to change this order of things. And in order to do so, there is only one way out. We need to change the rules of the game. We need to change the rules of the game, because without another regulation, we will not be able to change uh, this uh, situation. And if we want to exit this logic of a market-based society, it's not only a market economy we're talking about, it's also a market society. And if we want to include social uh, parameters, environmental parameters, obviously, uh, rules needed to be changed. And, uh, you know, we have to do something about that. I really believe that Europe should make a first step. E Europe should really change uh, some uh, key functioning rules. If I'm just taking this question further, and we know that um, time is somehow not playing on our side, and um, we've come already quite far into the opposite direction, as you were pointing out. so. Um, what should be a priority list and um, you know where should we start and what is feasible at all and uh, i would like um, to put this to our uh, leader from romania so what should be the priorities what should be done and just uh, try i think it's uh, on now yeah all right um, dear colleagues uh, i my staff has provided me the answers to your question but uh, Please allow me just one minute to, to say something from my heart, because it's a special uh, moment and uh, I'd like to use it. Eight years ago, I was the leader of the Social Democratic Youth in Romania, and uh, we had 3,000 young socialists uh, in a nice place next to the seaside, and we had a special guest coming to our event. And this special guest was Paul Nirov Rasmussen. And I want to thank him once again for those moments eight years ago when he proved to be a model for all the young socialists, European socialists. And uh, I would like to say once again that three hours spent in the car from Bucharest to, to Constanza, he convinced me to become a European citizen. And I'm very grateful to Paul Rasmussen for this.
And I think that his work and many other leaders' work should be continued in the future in a different Europe. Because uh, we join, when I say we, I'm talking about Romania, about Bulgaria, Sergei Stanishev, about Hungary. We join a Europe which was a dream Europe, a solidar Europe, a welfare Europe, a fair Europe. Now, just a few years after this, we found ourselves in our countries living not anymore in a democracy, having no more rights to pensions, to health, to education. And of course, the big difference is that right now, the answer is it's, it's about financing, it's about deficit, it's about economy, you stupid social democrats and socialists. And my answer is no, you are stupid, it's about people. It's about real solutions to make the economy and the financial rules to work for the people, not to make the people working for, for the banks. I had uh, the example of uh, a prime minister which still have my appreciation and my respect, George Papandreou. He told us and he proved us who we should not rely on. We should never rely on uh, Sarkozy, Merkel, Berlusconi and all the others. They are not a part of the European dream that the Eastern European has joined just a few years ago. So I, I will just tell you that, that the real the real solutions is to be honest, to, be, to understand that the, the, the Europe is changing, but that our goal is not to have small deficit, nice macroeconomic figures, but is to give back to the people the idea that they live in a fair and good Europe. And um, if I can just, you know, take you then even further, because I think we're not quite uh, there. And I want to, uh, luckily, I have the manuscripts from the workshops. And I just two, two quotes from the workshops. There was a workshop on a, Europe, a European fiscal revolution. And the quote is, the lack of progressive taxation is destroying our economy. We need a European fiscal revolution. And I'm sure in the workshop you discussed what that might look like. Another one, of course, is the issue. And uh, I just have to put it... Uh, um, to, to the other side of, of the leaders' panel. The question about financial transaction tax. So um, the workshop suggesting that the introduction of a European financial transaction tax would be the first step of a real European response to a crisis born out of three decades of unfettered finance. You'll forgive me for putting this, uh, uh, Emma, to you. Of course, you know, we're very um, keen on hearing what, um, what you say about this. Um, can I first say that on your principal question, um, Ed Miliband, the leader of our party, the Labour Party, at our annual conference, um, took on three decades of economic orthodoxy in our country by saying that the type of capitalism that we have now is not delivering for people. It may be delivering pe for people at the top, but it's not delivering for people at the bottom and in the middle. And he made a distinction between good and bad companies. And I think this is really important. And I will come to your question. I'm not avoiding it. But he said that we should reward the good companies that invest for the long term and take on apprenticeships, apprentices. And we should use the state to make sure that there is uh, less short-termism in our economy. And I come to your question now. We are in favor, favor of the principle of reducing um, the frequency of speculation. But we think that that can only be done on a global uh, level. Because, frankly, if we tax um, speculation here in, in Europe, including the UK, then our fear is that speculation will go to New York, which is our biggest competitor. London and New York are the biggest financial centers in the world. And it will also, if we're not careful, affect good things like pensions, because private pensions also rely on investment in, in, in the stock market. So there are reasons why we think this should be a global financial transaction tax. And we think our government let us down on this because it didn't lead the way in the G20. And one last word on this. The Tobin tax is not the same thing as the financial transaction tax. The current proposals for the financial transaction tax do not include um, foreign uh, reserve speculation. And the Tobin tax 
back in the 1970s, the original idea was to reduce the amount of foreign exchange speculation. And if we were to include that into the proposals, I think there'd be more chance of us getting a global agreement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Emma. I would like to um, bring jo Joseph Muscat on, uh, in on this one. Would you agree? Would you go along the lines of what Emma is, is uh, saying? I would, to say the truth. I think that one of the issues that we must put forward and one of the key messages that must come out of this convention is that we, the, we are not an anti-business movement. Even though this does not sound popular and I, even though the populist thing to say from the left-hand side of the spectrum is basically portraying business as the boogeyman, I think that we should distinguish between good business and bad business. The speculators and the genuine small entrepreneurs who work and provide good, stable jobs. And I think that is one of the basic things we must put forward as one of our core ideas. Secondly, um, during one of the workshops, the, the workshop I attended, I think our Swedish Social Democrats um, came up with a brilliant phrase, uh, phrase that encapsulates basically what we stand for. They said, we, we are for growth, yes, but it must be value-driven growth. And what are our values? Our values are social justice, our ecology, and our, the, the fact that we trust the, peop the people. Finally, I think that we should not fall in the trap of, of arguing whether it should be more Europe or less Europe. We should argue for a better Europe. Because if I am for integration, but I am not for the Mercosy integration, if it goes or the Barroso integration, I am for a social democrat integration. So as a social democrat, given the choice between national social democrat policies and transnational far-right policies, I would go for, the, for our own social democrat model at any point in time. So yes to integration, but it must be a progressive type of integration. Mm. Does, uh, uh, thank you, Joseph. Is anybody uh, on the panel who wants to, uh, maybe Alex Baudry, put uh, two uh, suggestions to the people that are flanking you, saying this is why you should go on to financial transaction tax? I think it's, it's a, a question of uh, equity. It's a question, so... Uh, I think it's a question of justice, the involvement of the financial uh, sector in this um, reconstruction phase of the European economy. I believe it is a key to avoid the traps. Uh, what about the golden rule? I know that some socialist um, governments have introduced this uh, golden uh, rule. But uh, it is really about reducing the public uh, finance issues to a budget issue. You know, we're talking about something else. We're talking about the budget of the state. The first uh, aim of the state budget is not to be a balanced one. It is there to guarantee the public finances. And so if, if we define in our constitution the state budget. I don't think that this definition should be limited to the budget balance or to uh, the debt. I believe we need first to define the objectives of a budget policy. It is a public service. It should be integrated in the collectivities. So we really have to highlight this difference in order to make a difference uh, from the right. I mean, you were just saying, you know, for a number of reasons, um, from your perspective, there should be a different path. But clearly, I mean, it's it, facing the, the difficulties of, of these days, it's important to have um, strong cooperation on those questions. And you can disagree, but you have to start marching into one direction at some uh, stage. And uh, the way, why I'm saying this is because it was also addressed in many of the workshops where you discussed the question, well, how can we cooperate better? Um, and that also includes a better cooperation, not only with countries that we desperately need to be part uh, uh, of the union. We can't do uh, uh, things without the United Kingdom, of course, and six 
succeed, but then also addressing the question of what about our cities, municipalities and regions. There were quite a few um, workshops that uh, looked at this in various shapes, and I would like uh, to put this to Karl-Heinz Lambers and, uh, of course, ask him you know, on his, his perspective on his vision um, of how a more regional, a more local, and I was in, in a workshop where even local currencies uh, were discussed. Uh, so what your vision is for this uh, question? Je suis intimement convaincu. I am deeply convinced that the recovery will have to go through local and regional authorities because this is where you have these stumbling blocks. Uh, they receive less and less money. The austerity measures have a strong impact on these collectivities. And we know that more and more people need some support and the uh, local collectivities are really trapped. They are in a deadlock. I also believe that changing the rules of the game can only be done at the EU level. And there is no contradiction, you know, between the EU level and the local level. This is actually about the multi-level governance. We really need to change the rules at the EU level. And we should allow the authorities that are the closest to the people, that is to say, the local and regional collectivities, we should enable them to act in order to reach this key objective, that is to say, providing some well-being to the populations. What has to be changed? Well, very simple things first. And it is really uh, included, embedded in the uh, socialist philosophy, democracy in order to reach the well-being. Two things need to be changed, I believe. We should not make more money with money than with the production uh, and services. And then, second, those. Uh, who work hard from the morning till the night, they should be able to um, sustain their families. And then, thirdly, we need to make our best so that those who are excluded from the society may benefit from some solidarity. We have been defending these values forever, but we need to adapt it now to the new situation. And I don't think that we should be misled by this speech on austerity. Austerity is actually killing the population well-being question, because I think we can agree that uh, in many areas, structures will have to be changed. And we know at pan-European level how difficult this is. And this is why everybody's tiptoeing when it comes to any treaty reforms. And, you know, as happy as you might be to hear that uh, people are suggesting bring back more powers uh, to local levels, have uh, investment. And the transport workshop also talked about that. Um, transport policy needs a focus on shift from road to rail and waters to local and regional investments. Um, you know, we can, we can talk about this. And and, and wish for it, but what are signs um, that you see that this can actually happen if we really have to change a whole system operating, knowing that you've been engaging for such a long time on the strengthening the regions in, in Europe? Are they ready? Are they there? Europe s'est arrêtée à mi-chemin. Europe stopped at uh, the middle of the road because we have a common currency, but we do not have a common uh, economic policy. Europe should refocus really on a few things. We have to promote this multi-level governance. We're going to have big challenges at European level, at local and regional level. And I'm sure that at that level we have a, a lot of opportunities and uh, we have to promote and uh, develop creativity and innovation. It's up to the local and regional authorities to do so because they are really um, at the head of uh, creativity and innovation. When you look at what is going on at local level, you can see that people try and develop new initiatives, innovative di initiatives. The funding dimension has also to be included. It's quite paradoxical if you take Belgium with a high indebtedness level, well, you have twice more savings than public debt. 
It means that money that people have should be used, should be put together to do something constructive and uh, to bring some added value at local and regional level. Because this is, in a way, paying a tribute and rendering services to the people. Uh, gain um, the driving seat back and the second one how can cooperation um, work better and uh, that third one and I want to put uh, a bit of time into this we don't have massive time and this is crucial and this is the question well then what should a progressive and balanced economic model look like and um, I'm sure we will have uh, uh, already um, prepared from your no. staff <laughs> Victor Bonta, the answers to this but let me just uh, go briefly to what's here in the workshops you said um, you said for instance in the workshop on new economics of fair growth it's not only a question of redistribution of wealth and growth but it's also about good jobs well-being and sharing time notably working time um, so there were quite concrete discussions about this and if we want uh, to ask the question, well, what should a progressive uh, economy look like? I think you all have to contribute to this, and I would like to start uh, with you, Victor Panta. You see, I, I have avoided some of the answers because the, the situation is not at all the same in our countries like here, because right now the European position, the leadership, uh, it's a very conservative and a very selfish position. They do not really care about the, the country which, is, which are outside of the Eurozone. They don't tackle it, they don't really care about uh, centralizing and giving more powers to the regions. And uh, uh, what we need, we need a real European politics, which we don't have right now. When I'm looking forward to have uh, a socialist president in France or a social democratic chancellor in Germany, I'm looking forward to have once again, after a few years, a European politics, which we don't have right now. Because otherwise, the situation in Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary do not, like, do, uh, do not look like the one in, in Germany or France. If we don't have a real European construction, we won't have solutions for different problems. That's why I have avoided the answers, because, for example, we have no problems with the Romanian banks because we have no more Romanian banks. That's the, the we, we don't have problems with the regions because we have no more regions. We have only a centralized. We don't have problems with the European Commission because we deal only with the IMF. The European Commission does not care about Romania or Hungary, for example. If we don't have a European real politics and strategy, right now we have only a selfish and something like a, a German, French leadership conservative position. That's why. My answers and some Sergei Stanishev, Mr. Hazi answers should not be very clear for, for, uh, for the Western, the old Europe, because the situation is not the same, but we all need a real European polit politics, and I hope that next year we will have one. Let me, um, and uh, you're kind of avoiding, I see that, so I have to move uh, to the other side a little bit <laughs> and uh, asking, uh, quoting another workshop, um, talking in particular about wages, um, wages in times of austerity. Um, Europe needs an alternative economic policy which is not based on wage cuts and austerity. We have to reverse the trend of increasing inequality in our society. So, um, Josef Muscat, from your perspective, um, wh what's your response to those who put this together in the workshop? My response to your original question is very simple. We need credibility. As a left, we need more credibility. It is important for us to um, discuss and share ideas on how to distribute wealth. But I think first we need to answer a more fundamental question, how we create that wealth. And unless we are straightforward with our electorate, unless we are straightforward with our people, that yes, we are better at distributing wealth. I think everyone knows that we are fairer than the right and the far right at having, giving everyone an opportunity for success, at giving everyone a fair deal in our economy. What we need to convince people about is that we are also better at creating that wealth. Mm. Then this is, this is the core issue, I think. The core issue is how to have a credible 
national and European policy in our, in our regards. Mm. Um, I think that we cannot come out of this convention as the people who don't care about deficits. We are the people who want growth. We are the people who realize that by to create better jobs, we need growth. But we have to be realistic also to say that, yes, we will prioritize growth, but we will not abandon public finances. If we say things just for the sake of saying them, without coming out with clear strategies, we will, okay, we might win elections, but we would then fail miserably when we are in government. So I think we can have to come out of this as a credible alternative that recognizes the problems of public finances, that's saying we will tackle those, those problems, we will not let them go away, because they won't go away, but we will do it in a fairer way, through growth. Mm. Emma, let me put this to you. Credibility. How can we, when there is, uh, amongst many people, even a fundamental um, um, mistrust in the fact that democracy can deliver? Um, democracy is some of this old lady, uh, um, and, and it's really not fast enough, and the markets are just squeezing it into the corners, um, especially at European level. There are parliaments that want to speak. There is even the issues being discussed, saying, well, uh, are parliaments a hindrance and things like that, which, uh, frankly, is, I don't think, the right way of framing the debate. But people are fundamental, uh, fundamentally questioning the capacity of democracies in Europe to actually create that credibility. Can we deliver on this? Can we create this credibility? Well, firstly, just to say that, frankly, we're not in power in enough countries in the European Union. There was a time um, some years ago when there were only 15 member states, and we were in government, our parties were in government in 11 out of 15 of those member states. So the first thing we need to do is get back power. That's incredibly important because we can't carry out or implement any of these policies if we're not in government. And as Joseph said, it's absolutely right that we need to rebuild economic credibility. And my party, the Labour Party, lost economic credibility uh, a year and a half ago. We, we had our second worst electoral defeat in our history. And part of the reason for that is people started to blame us for a recession, and that is often what has happened. We've seen our Spanish friends, unfortunately, lose on Sunday. Some of our governments were unpopular because of inc incumbency and because it was a difficult time. And it's absolutely right to say we cannot be unrealistic about deficits. We have to cut deficits to a certain extent, but we have to say how we would do that differently. We wouldn't do it as quickly. In our country, the Conservatives are hell-bent on creating a smaller state, yet they're blaming us and saying that the deficit's too high and using that as an excuse. And that's worked for a year and a half. It's a big public relations coup. They've been very successful. But that's starting to turn because we've seen one million unemployed young people in our country, unemployment at 17 year high, inflation at over 5%. People are suffering and it's because you need growth before you can cut deficits. And we're now urging the government to bring forward investment plans, to bring forward um, tax breaks for companies who are taking on workers, to help young people back in work. We have to stimulate the private sector as well as dealing with the public sector to make sure that the economy grows and that's the only way we're gonna bring our deficits down. And just uh, um, because uh, Alex Baudry wanted to uh, jump in at this point, I'll come back to you in a second on a, another issue. Question la credibility. Je crois que la, la credibility, is the... credibility. Credibility is not only based on economic issues, but it's based on, on many things. The social dimension is, of course, our, our core business. It's the main issue on which socialist parties are going to be assessed. So if we want to regain credibility as socialists, we have to admit that we have also made a few mistakes, that even some progressive parties made mistakes in the past. We have to be ready to uh, recognize that. Otherwise, we won't be able to recover this credibility. So let's first have this critical look at the mistakes we made, and then I think we will um, increase our credibility. Well, I think that a uh, few parties were, were uh, accepted the regulation and they thought that the regulation would automatically lead to an increase in well-being. 
But this did not happen, of course. We know that we cannot leave the markets on their own. Oui, je crois que cette autocritique est nécessaire. Well, this self-criticism is necessary. Let me remind you of the fact that the Balkenstein Directive has been approved by a commission with a majority of ministers appointed by socialist uh, governments. And this vote took only 30 seconds. But it's also the uh, PS which at that time started the dynamics which led to uh, uh, another solution to a uh, more or less acceptable solution at the European Parliament level. We can't say and everything. We have to be fair. There are some ideas which we know will never be possible to implement. We need to be credible as to our objectives and the, the, the means, the resources to achieve such goals. We need to relaunch, we have to, to refocus on growth. We should not uh, maximize profit at any cost. We cannot uh, create uh, conditions uh, that will lead to a decrease in politics. We have to define very strict rules, for instance, for financial markets. And at EU level, we have to make sure that we're going to develop economic activities to make business, to earn money, but in a reasonable way and with a fair sharing between all those who contributed we have to come back to the fundamentals of politics. And I'm sure that thanks to a very good campaign, European campaign, thanks to the commitment of all the countries, we will convince more and more people. One final question that also comes uh, from the workshop where the question was addressed how um, we can also help the people to cope with change. And um, we discussed already that the systems need to be changed. There is uh, a vision emerging uh, probably uh, with greater clarity after this convention where things uh, also should be, should be going. But then um, it is extremely challenging to uh, change a system um, under stress, which is incomplete, and then have still the support uh, of those out there that will in the first place only feel um, the damage that uh, the current system is doing to them. So if you were to address also, you know, um, all those that were in the workshops um, um, with the question, well, how, how to do that? How to convince people that changing the system is something that we probably have not done enough in the past and have not learned? And I was just sitting next to a Hassan from Egypt uh, who is in a country that is fundamentally changing. Do we have in our minds probably have to get used to a lot bigger changes, and how do we explain this to our citizens? So I, I would like to put the question to you, Joseph Muscat. I think democracy is the answer. I think democracy will catch up with, with us sooner or later. What was the defining moment of the past few months of the economic crisis? I think it was when our comrade George decided to um, fetch the, a credible solution, saying let people have their say shock and horror why um, everyone down uh, all the speculators all the powers that be saying well we shouldn't let people have their say it might be postponed but it will stay there we can ride, we, we can run but we cannot hide and so it's the answer is standing up and being the ones who advocate more democracy in europe and advocating not more powers to unelected officials who decide on their own, be it in a boardroom or in the Berlemont, but decisions being taken in a democratic manner. Mm. Emma, let me put uh, this to you. Democracy is the answer. Um, out there are many people that will um, essentially say democracy is the problem. And we're out camping here, and I put it really that far to make the point, you know, are out camping in St. Paul's Cathedral in the city of London and saying this democracy is not uh, in the interest of, of us people. And, you know, what do you respond to those who have, and, and I think we have to address this, there is a mistrust in democratic institutions, in particular on European level, and I'll bring others in on this question, you know, not only uh, the city of London uh, uh, is, is relevant in this regard. So what do we say to those that say, well, democracy is the problem? 
Uh, well, I think it was Winston Churchill who said democracy is the least worst form of government. I think that's absolutely right. I don't see any alternative uh, to democracy. Well, there are alternatives, but they're pretty scary. And I think the Arab Spring has shown us just what power people have and how incredibly brave people are to challenge a system, a system in which they were oppressed, a system in which they didn't have freedom, a system in which they didn't have a say. And I was incredibly proud of the people who uh, protested in Tahrir Square and they're doing it again. Uh, but you know, we've had elections in Tunisia, we've got a democracy in Tunisia. I'm incredibly touched by what happened earlier this year in North Africa and it, that just shows the power of people to drive change and to drive democracy which is the best form of government even if it's imperfect. Right, thank you. Um, yes, please, uh, Alex Baudry wants to... Je dirais simplement que je crois que y a, la réponse doit tourner autour de deux notions. There are two important dimensions, justice and hope. Each time we have to look whether the solution is considered as fair. We have to compare the effort and see whether it is uh, going to lead to a, a fair solution. And sometimes people don't have the feeling that this burden is, is shared properly. In Europe, there is a lack of uh, hope for people who very often are in a desperate situation. It's up to us as European socialists to combine this discipline, which is necessary, with growth and hope, hope for the future. Just very uh, final statements and contributions uh, by Karl-Heinz Sambatz and... Uh, uh, la democracy. democracy is a solution. We have to convince people about our values, hope, hope for this uh, life, for now. We have to make credible the prospect of a change. And we also have to encourage the dialogue. Today, a lot of people are, are selfish. And uh, this comes first, before solidarity. We have to make sure that the only way out is based on solidarity that we should not underestimate the danger of people preferring to give up the democratic and the freedom in uh, and because it, it happened in Europe in the 30s after a huge economic crisis a lot of people in room in uh, in Europe they prefer dictatorships or something like that I think it's easier to say than to do but we must do it very credible leaders and very pragmatic and credible programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Victor Panza. We're leaving on a, a concerned note, but I think this is very uh, good and important because uh, the questions that uh, we have to address are tough ones. Um, I think we managed on this panel to uh, address um, some of the questions, and they were yours. And I would like to thank uh, all those in the workshops that uh, made this happen and helped us uh, guiding and having a debate. Um, Emma Reynolds, gentlemen, thank you very much for what I thought was a very good session. Thanks to you again. And we will now have two high-level speeches announced by Secretary General Philippe Caudry. Thank you very much. Thank you.